Okay, so we're gonna start and um and as you know, none of that was yeah, that's there's there's a lot more to that story than we than we used to know. We know that story. Uh, um, but anyway, it's not it's not the same at all. So anyway, um Oh the teacher has to say that happens. We are going to, we're almost exactly where we need to be. I'm going to go ahead and put the black death one up. Yeah, I still don't feel good if you weren't. Um, let's see, yeah, there's the black death in there, so we need to finish. Okay. So I'll see you after the, this. Thank you. That's awesome. Because that way I'll get all the caffeinated freaking. Somebody told me I had a vision one time. I think he said it's a compliment. I thought it was cute. Um, my work study, I love it. Anyway, we've got to uh, finish up just a little bit of this stuff. And if you weren't in here, I was like either grousing and complaining or just stating the fact, depending on what you think. Um, I was talking about the fact that I did actually have to go to the doctor yesterday because I couldn't breathe. Yeah. And ended up that I actually have bronchitis. Uh, and she said if I'd waited a few more days, it could have gone into pneumonia, so blah, 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 blah. I ended up with four medications and was told not to come to work today. And I said, I'm not do that. I'm tougher than that. Actually, what I said was it's, very, it, it's the last day of class. And also, I went to Springfield this morning and it would be there by nine. Ooh, that was fun. So, and that was three hours of talking, three hours of talking. So I've already, you know, my voice is like, I don't like this, but we're going to get done with this. And I am going to sit down again and be lazy uh, because, you know, kind of sick. So we're going to finish it though. What we have ended up with, I told you the story of John, of John the Hood. And I think I had mentioned here, you know, just as far as the Jacquerie, they all use the name um, Jacques, which is kind of like John. John Doe, they're trying to be anonymous. And what they're doing in that case is they're, hang on, let me check one thing, make sure that the, the um, Fort Knox people are going to be able to hear everything. Okay, that's, uh, okay, just, just double checking for Fort Knox. Um, okay, but anyway, the peasants are going to be, uh, the peasant revolts going to be put down, they've killed a lot of nobles and so on, a lot of innocent peasants are slaughtered. Then you have the story of Joan of Arc, all this stuff, this was on, um, I don't know, I feel like I recorded this on um, audio a little bit too here with the Joan of Arc stuff. But Joan of Arc, yeah, there's some legends about her. Did she actually dress as a man and lead the troops in the you know, victory? Or did she just help the morale? Who knows? What we know is that something happened. And she told the Dauphin, D-A-U-P-H-I-N, the Dauphin is an heir to the throne. It's the prince, the crown prince, the one who's going to be king. She told um, Charles, the, well, who, the guy who would become Charles VII, the prince, that she had heard God tell him, you know, tell him that she should lead the prince to victory. Mm -hmm. And when you hear that, God is on your side, of course, as I said, that's very important. Raise the morale of the French troops, and they were able to actually come back, and they were actually able to win this war. It's amazing, okay? Joan of Arc plays a huge part in that. Whatever she did, whoever she was, but she is eventually going to be captured, tried as a heretic, remember, going against the church because she said that God was on the side of the French and said the English are not going to like that. Anyway, she was condemned burning, for burning at the stake, horrible death, uh, and then the church is going to make up for that by sainting her in 1920. But she's just a, a teenager when that happened. Now, Charles was afraid to actually have himself crowned king for a very long time because he was afraid that would bring the English, you know, kind of they, they would they would recognize what was going on. That would be an easy target. You know, that's where the, the new king is. It's what's a lot of the bureaucracies there. There's a lot of ceremony. But after this, 
He reorganizes his army, reorganizes the French group, uh, government around himself. Okay, He builds up his army. Now, he gives them the best technology available. The numbers are going to be much bigger than England's numbers. Okay, And so now we start to see things are turning. The momentum is heading toward the French. Because remember, for a long time, the Hundred Years' War, it looked like the English were going to win. The English were just going to take over. They were going to take over France. So we have weapons, you know, we have gunpowder, like we said before, firearm cannons. And then the last battle of this war is important because the last battle is also the first of something. Okay? When in history, remember I told you you need to know the last and the first. This one is both. It's the last battle of the Hundred Years' War, but it's also the first battle in European history where artillery decided it, and it decided it for the French. They had cannons. Okay, they had cannons, and so they were able to defeat the British, or, you know, to defeat um, the English. And so 1453, we see the end of this war. Now, the questions that come up after that are, you know, what happened here? Who won the war? Well, the French lost a lot of battles. You've heard the expression, maybe you can lose the battle but win the war. Well, they held on to their territory. They're not taken over by the English, so, you know, this is what happened here. And then if you take History 105, you're going to end up studying about absolutism. This helped lead to absolutism. And this is where we really start for today, okay, secular literature. Secular literature implies that you are writing about things that are not church-related. Okay? It's not about God. It's not sermons. It's not religious. It's something about emotions and the human thing. Human thing. Okay? Love and pain, whatever. Now, one of the guys here who, who is important is named Petrarch. Okay, it's a portrait of Petrarch over there on the bottom left. Petrarch supposedly had this great unrequited love, much like Dante. Remember, Dante had the great unrequited love, Beatrice. Petrarch has Laura. Supposedly, he had seen Laura when he was a little guy. Uh, in a church, and she was so beautiful, she was kneeling at the altar, and he just fell in love when he was a little kid, and they were never together, kind of like, you know, Dante and so on. But what he does, though, is, is well, throughout his life, he's asked by people why he continues to write these poems, these love poems for this woman who he was never able to be with. She also died just like Beatrice, young, believe in childbirth also, married to someone else. But he's asked why he keeps writing all these love poems to someone who's not alive and someone he was never able to be with. And he says, because no other woman would ever stand up to her. She's you know, perfect, kind of like Dante. So there's a lot of similarities between his relationship or his wishful relationship with Laura. Some people even have theorized that he made her up because maybe he just took an amalgamation of just whatever characteristics from different women that he thought were perfect. Like maybe he gave, he maybe he liked this one's eyes, and so he gave her, you know, gave them to her. Maybe he liked this one's um, sense of charity and giving. Maybe he liked. So in other words, a lot of people questioned whether she even really existed. But he continued to write poetry about her. So we call these the Petrarchan sides, the love sonnets. A lot of them, you know, longing from a broken heart. Now, here's where we get into my favorite stuff, though, when it comes to this particular lecture. It's going to be the Canterbury Tales. Canterbury Tales, if you had to read any of the Canterbury Tales in high school, you, you may have had to read the Knight's Tale. You may have had to read the Wife of Bath's Tale. Um, I don't know if you, you know if you didn't have to read it or if you did. Uh, if you've never read them, you need to be in the classroom usually to read most of them because some of them are a little bit just kind of like the Indian and just like the Odyssey and just like any of these classics we've talked about before, um, Inferno and you know, the Comedia and so on. This was pretty hard to read and to, to, in some cases, to glean the understanding of what he's doing. But here's the basic thing, okay? Geoffrey Chaucer is writing this collection of stories and he's knitting them all together through what we call a frame tale. Now, we deal with frame tales all the time today. We don't call them that. We recognize them. If I tell you what they are, you're going to recognize them as pretty much every, you know, every one of those, like, TV shows you see that has, um, oh, probably one of the 
the best examples is a soap opera or something, where you have like 25 different things going on, but then there's the main thing that ties them all together. Maybe it's General Hospital, something like that, right? Something ties them all together. That's a frame tail. Now, here's what he does, is he has a frame tail set where you have a bunch of Christian pilgrims on their way to Canterbury to go visit a shrine. Okay, that was something very important to Christians at this time. You would make your way at some point in your life, like much, much like Muslims do today, to Mecca and Medina. You're going to have Christians making a, a pilgrimage to a shrine. In this case, to Canterbury, Thomas Effect Shrine. Now, that's the story. Okay, the Canterbury Tales. It's a bunch of travelers on their way to Canterbury. Okay, that's frame tale. That's the big story that keeps everything else inside of it. Now, in that big story, you have a bunch of characters. Let's just say it's all of us. And we're back here in the 1300s, and we're trying to head over to Canterbury. Okay, So we're, we're walking, or we're maybe riding on horseback, and we're lucky we may have a wagon. But we're certainly not riding a car, a plane, a train, you know, anything like that. We're certainly not going to have any devices to distract us. We're probably going to be poor, and we're not even going to have books to distract us. Plus, if we're walking or riding on horseback, that'd be dangerous anyway. So you've got these people that travel in groups. These pilgrims going to the shrines are going to travel in groups for safety. Now, what we see here in this story is he has, say, all of us. We're all traveling together for safety. We have our horses. We have whatever. We brought what we need with us to get there. But it's a long trek. I mean, it may take us months to get there. I don't know. Depends on where we start, depends on where we're going. So what do we do? Well, we certainly, like I said, we don't sit in the back of the car with the iPad and play Mario Run or something like Zach might do. What you do is you talk to each other hmm, to pass the time. Imagine that. You actually have conversations with each other. And what he has these people doing is telling stories to each other to pass the time. Okay, that's what they do. That's how they pass the time. Now, the frame tale is they're walking and riding and heading out together. But within that frame are all kinds of stories. Now, each one of the stories is named for the person who tells it. Okay? So, like I said, you have a story that's told by the wife of Bath. And that was, that was a, a really interesting old lady character uh, that he creates who had been married to, seven, she had seven husbands, but none of them had been legally married to her. And she had just all this, she, her story was, was full of all sorts of sexual innuendo and it was kind of filthy, even by today's standards. It's, it's kind of rough if you can understand some of the innuendos. You have the knight's tale, the knight's gonna give you a different kind of morality tale and so on. So each tale is going to be named for the character that's telling it on the way to Canterbury to the other people. My favorite, the one I'm going to tell to you, is the partner's tale. Okay, partner's tale is, now again, Canterbury Tales, let me go back one just real fast to make sure you see this. Okay, most of them are in verse, and most of them are in poetry, you know, verse. Some of them are in prose, okay, these two are in, in narrative form, but some of them are not made up by Chaucer. Some of them are old tales, as far back as you could go. For example, the partner's tale. This one, we believe, is an old tale from the Orient. Okay, We're not sure exactly the origin, but we know that Chaucer writes it in his own form. And again, this is my favorite, the character name, you know, not named, but the character called the partner, because that's his, um, that's his lot in life, that's his, his particular occupation, is going to tell this story. And here's how the story goes. You have these three young guys, probably, you know, probably late teens, and they're coming back drunk from a funeral. So one of their friends had died very young, and they're just furious, and they're drinking, you know, and just, just cursing, and they're so angry because their friend has died, and he was taken too soon. So they determine in their drunken stupor and in their anger and heartbreak, they determine that they are going to hunt down and kill death, okay? They're going to kill death. So that's interesting. How are we going to kill death? Well, what they do is they are walking down the, you know, down the road, and they meet an old man, 
And one of the little young teenager dudes here looks at the old man and says, hey, old man, we're looking for death. Do you know where he is? We figure you might know because you're closer to him than we are. You can imagine the old man is not very pleased with this and the implications of such. And so he's thinking, he's like, yeah, boys, I know exactly where death is. It's right over there under that tree. And he points to a tree kind of off the path a little bit. And the three boys that are excited are going over to kill death. Okay, run right over there. And what they discover under the tree is not death. It's a bag of gold. More than they could ever imagine. Riches, wealth beyond their wildest dreams. And so there's three of them. And they're sitting there, figure, they're standing there, figuring out, and sitting there, and they're there for a long time, figuring out, okay, how are we going to get this money back? How are we going to split it up? How are we going to be safe when we travel with this money? We've got to make sure that we have a plan to get the money to safety. And we're going to be rich beyond our wildest dreams. It's going to be great. So, meantime, they start to get hungry and thirsty. They're out there with nothing to eat and drink because they're obsessed with this money and they literally draw straws, you know, like hay straws. They go out and they draw straws because one of them is gonna to have to go into the village. One of them is gonna to have to go to the village to get them some wine and some cheese. Gotta have some food and something to drink. So these guys draw straws and the youngest guy, he actually gets the short straw. He goes into the village to get the food and the drink, the file, the other two, have, he's left the other two there because you, can, you, you don't want to leave one guy to guard the money because he'd run off with it, right? So you leave two to guard the money. Now, while he's gone, they start talking. They start thinking, you know, if we could just, I don't know, kill this guy when he comes back from town with the food and the drink, if we could just kill him, we could split the money between the two of us, and we would have a lot more money, right? Instead of splitting it three ways, we could each have half. And so they make a plan. When he comes back, we're going to kill him. We're going to stab him there. See the picture up there? They're holding their daggers. Now, he comes back, and all the way back, he's thinking, you know, he's, he's like, well, you know, if for some reason I could maybe poison the wine, I could get all the money. They'll drink the wine, I won't drink it, and then I can keep all the money for myself. So he comes back with the, with the wine and the cheese, and they attack him immediately and stab him to death. And then they celebrate by drinking the wine. Mm -hmm. So what actually was under that tree? Yeah. Death. Death was actually under the tree. What's the moral of that story, really? Don't be in a drunken stupor trying to fight death. Don't wish for something that you want to, you want to kill death. Death kills you. I say there's one word you can sum it up with. You know greed. it. Greed. 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 And don't be greedy. Okay. You got you got enough gold for all three of you. Why are you trying to kill your friends to get more of it? Okay. So yeah, that's about greed. Now he didn't write that again from his own imagination. We believe this was a very uh, very ancient tale from the Orient. Anyway, a lot of his tales are like that. Some of them have moralities, morality um, ideas, some of them don't. But it is worthwhile if you ever get a chance to read some of them. Um, like I said, it, it helped me to read them in class, the ones that I've had to read. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a huge Chaucer fan, but I am a huge fan of some of the particular tales. Okay, now let's go to the Black Death, because this is the last thing. This is the last thing we're going to do if we get done early. Guess what? We get out early today. It's entirely up to how far we get with this one in the amount of time. I don't think it'll take the entire um, the entire class period because when I did like did some of the audio and stuff, I think I did a little bit more of whatever. I, I think we're going to be just fine. I think this is going to get you out maybe a little bit early today because it's not that short. I looked at it this morning. And I was like, wow, I forgot the Black Death. It's not that, that long. Or it's not that long, rather. Sorry, it's pretty short. Medication, they can be even crazier than usual. Okay, now that I'm on actual real medication, all right. But you know what they won't give you anymore? I like, told you they won't give you a shot anymore when you're sick, and they won't give you cough syrup that works. You notice that? They won't give you cough syrup because there's some 
ignorant people that, that want to get high on cough syrup. What the heck? I just want my cough to stop. Okay, <laughs> black death. Now, we don't know a lot. Let me do this before you start trying to write everything down. Let me explain that sometimes people erroneously call the black death the bubonic plague or sometimes the black plague. That's eh, close enough. But it's not just the bubonic plague. There's all sorts of other pestilences, we believe, that went into this, this period of time where you had about 25 to 30% of Europe dying. Okay? 25 to 30% of your population is gone during this period from about, eh, from about 1347 to 1352-ish, okay, from, from that period. So the Black Death is, is sometimes what we call it. That, that's okay. But if you call it the bubonic plague and you think that you've covered it, you've not even come close. Okay, black death is okay. Black, um, you know, the black plague is even okay. But again, remember, there's not just one or two or three things happening that kill all these people in Europe. Many pestilences. Now, here's what we know. There's so much we don't know. But here's what we do know. We know that the origins of the Black Death are a little bit murky, but we think that as far as it goes, the transmission of this disease, the main means of transmission were these oriental rat fleas, these fleas that lived on the back of these rats. Now, blame it on these oriental rat fleas. Why are we doing that? Well, give me a minute and I'll tell you. But we do know that the Black Death was one of the worst natural disasters in history. Okay, not a man-made disaster, a natural disaster that killed again a quarter to a third of the people. Now, in 1347, we see the beginnings of this great plague. This one. It's not the only time we have a plague. It's the only time we have one that is this devastating to Europe. Okay. Now. Most of the sources agree, but why do they agree about these oriental rat fleas? Well, here's why. Okay, there's disagreement as to the exact origins, but in October 1347, a Genoese flea, this is, this is going to be merchants, okay, from Genoa, returning from the Orient, okay, staggered into Messina Harbor with all the members of the crew either dead or dying from one version or other of the plague. This is from one of my favorite historians and one of my favorite books that I mention all the time in History 104. It's called The World Lit Only by Fire, William Manchester. He also wrote an excellent book called Death of a President right after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I mean, right within the, the year, like right after Kennedy was assassinated. He wrote a very, very good book about that. But he's also, he's also a medieval historian as his, I believe, his first love. So we see here evidence Okay. There's, there's contemporaneous evidence that these guys come in with the plague. Where are they coming from? The Orient. Now, China's a little bit quiet about certain things. China is not going to give us a lot of information as to what was going on. Was there a great plague in China right before this? Some evidence says yes. Sometimes it's a little harder to dig and get into what the Chinese uh, may have hidden from us. But we know this happened. Okay. So we start there. We start with what we know. Now, the spread of the Black Death is going to be around the trade routes. If you look at the trade routes, and then you look up at the, you know, look up at the little map I've got up here, you see the yellow spots. The yellow spots, these are regions that are either partially or totally spared from the plague. Okay? Notice that many of them are kind of offset. Many of them are offset, like you go down here, right here, right here. These are a little bit offset from the trade routes. That's kind of out of the way. That one's way out of the way. Okay. This one, there's some over here, there's some over here, but they're, they're a little bit off the path. Okay. And then you can just kind of look at that. But the ones that are kind of yellow, orangey color, they're not going to be right on the major trade routes for the most part. Okay. For the most part, they're going to be a little bit offset. So we see the spread of the Black Death. You don't need to know the spread of it, but you do need to know, you know, be aware that it's going to go, in many ways, we believe it was through the merchants. The merchants are spreading as they travel from place to place. Now, Just a note, Ed. Yeah. Now, 
But the trade route right there only showed that part of the world. Wasn't they trading in other parts of the world also at that time? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We're just that's just a little one. This is oh yeah, trade is everywhere, but this is the European. This is like the European trade routes that we're talking about, because it's European. Right. Europe's the one that's going to get hit by the plague here. So, I mean, we don't have the Great Plague going on in the Americas, or we don't have the Great Plague going on over in, you know, any of the other continents. That right. we so the on. plague never made it outside that area. Well, again, we probably know. China, but again, there's a lot of question about what. China's willing to let us know about some of their history. Right. So China's a very, very closed off culture, if you guys didn't know that. It's a little bit closed off in some ways, right. um, as far as as far as history. So I've read a lot of scholarly articles that say we don't really know. But yeah, I mean, Europe is the one we're talking about. So we're basically going to concentrate on what we know for sure. But over the years, I've been looking uh, into different things about China as far as their contribution here. But yeah, there's there's all, and it's not ever, and, it, and I'm not saying it didn't hit other parts of the world. There's other parts of the world that would have definitely gotten exposure to this. Right. But Europe is the one that has the big cities that are going to be you know, right here at the center of the trade. I mean, we've got Paris. We've got, if you recall, the Hanseatic League, Lubeck and Hamburg, and you have all of these places, Rome, Naples, and then over here in Turkey, Constantinople, or the, you know, the old Ottoman Empire and so on, um, Asia Minor, you're going to have all these routes that are going to be heavily populated. Okay? So that's part of it. And part of it also, too, is because it's what we concentrate on. That also is something, like I said, that I've been looking into off and on for a few years because I am kind of curious. None of us that teach history here have ever uh, been qualified to teach. I, I would kind of like to get qualified to teach it. Uh, to teach any of the, the um, Asian history, because none of us have really studied that very deeply. We're all European and American um, history people. But you need to know the three types of the play. Okay, you need to know this, because remember, you're not going to have any notes on this test. At the same time, I remember in the textbook, they said also the Jew, most of the, Jew, most of the Jewish cut in my European countries, the ultra-black spare as well, because they have like, yeah, we're about to have that as one of our one of our five results of the plague and one yeah. of the yeah. And I was also, but I, when I saw the yellow, I wonder are those Jewish countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the Jew there's no Jewish countries uh, at that point because there's the Jewish peoples have always been a very small uh, minority, like in the United States right now, yeah. roughly two percent. Did you know that? You mentioned that two percent, very small minorities. Um, you end up with with Israel in 1948. That's a that's a different thing. That's a you know that's and an unusual was, thing. I know there was so, whole, I know there was Poland because they have a population of that as well. There's there's a lot of there were a lot of Russian Jews. There were a lot of Russian Poles. There were a lot of Russian you know. But that wasn't um, wasn't really a Jewish country. A lot of the whose grandparents escaped from uh, from uh, from uh, Poland. Well, I think maybe Grandma escaped from Russia and Grandma escaped from Poland and they ended up in, in LA or somewhere. But anyway, we have I mean, the, the Jewish people are going to be just like any other ethnic group, they're going to be dispersed all around. Uh, Israel's going to be a different situation where they're trying to create you know, the homeland and that type of thing. And that's not until 1948, by the way. Yeah, more, more so, towards World War II, right? Yes, 48. Um, so three types of play. You need to know the name of the bacteria that causes the play. Oh my goodness, the bacteria. This is hilarious on test duty. I can tell people either weren't here or weren't paying attention or didn't look at it again. Because Yasernia pestis. I've had if that's on if that's on the test, if the one you get is an identification question. And it's like Usernia pestis. You have to tell who it is, where it is, what it is, why it's important. I have people say, she was the mother of King so and so, and all this stuff. And I'm like, wow, that's creative. I get some really wild answers for what's also known as Y pestis, Usernia pestis. That is the bacteria that causes the plague, okay? Now remember, if you have a bacterial infection, you are contagious, right? Yes. You can be contagious. You can also, though, today, if you have a bacterial infection, you can cure it. How? Usually. By 
I learned biology is basically cured by the actual disease by making that antibiotics. Anti well, antibiotics. Yeah. Okay, antibiotics, because antibiotics are not useful on viruses. That's why if you have a cold, they're like, yeah, hey, yeah, just go lay down somewhere you can get that in a couple of weeks. Um, whereas if you have a bacterial infection, you can take antibiotics, and that'll most of the time they'll be able to at least help a little bit. We're getting more antibiotic resistant as the years go on, but but you know the depths of that are to be be argued. Now bacteria. That's important because they don't understand germ theory, they don't understand bacteria, they don't understand any of these things you can't see, any of these things that are not visible. So, do you guys know when we ended up with antibiotics? It's going to be a while since the plague. This is 1340s and 50s. I think you're okay. I was saying, thinking around probably the right time. The ideas, general ideas. You don't have to give me a specific no. year, like January first. No, no, no. I'm, not, I'm thinking. I know as a scientist, I know as a scientist, but I, I forgot what kind of year it was. Yeah, yeah. Because I know he took it somewhere. Okay, so we've got um, the first antibiotics are going to come between the two world wars. Okay, the two world wars. So between you know 1918, 1919, 1939-ish, you know, some in the late 30s, and early 40s. We're testing these. World War One, we don't have antibiotics. Test a lot of infections. A lot of guys die from that. Also, in World War One, 1918, you had this thing called the Great Influenza, which actually killed more men than the war. And the flu. There's this outbreak of the flu. It's just horrible. I think they call that. They call Spanish influenza. Yeah, it was the Spanish. It was a. Uh, it was a strain of Spanish flu. It's called the Great Influenza. Um, I have a great book about that. People I want to read. Well, I don't know if you want to read a book about the great influenza. It's pretty awesome. But the bacteria are found mainly in rodents. Now, rodents. We still have rodents, right? We have rats. We have mice. We have squirrels. What's a squirrel but a little mouse with a long tail? Who looks cute? Now we also have we also have prairie dogs. We also have other forms of rodents. Okay, so have we eradicated the plague? Is the plague just completely gone today? We still have outbreaks of the plague today. Sometimes you might look and you're like, oh, well, there's, I mean, if you're like me, you look and you say, oh, well, the bubonic plague has been found in Colorado or New Mexico. And if you're me, you say, eh, okay, that's cool. Because you know what they have today? Antibiotics. And you know what happens is you get some medicine. And if they catch it early enough, the bubonic plague is not terrifying. There was, a, I don't remember how many years ago, there was a pretty good little outbreak of uh, the bubonic plague in Colorado and one in New Mexico. Prairie dogs, that kind of stuff. Um, again, just any sort of rodent, flea bites, and so on. Now, that bacteria is going to cause three different kinds of the plague, and they're going to manifest, each one's going to manifest differently. First one, the bubonic plague, is the least of your worries. That's probably the one most of you have heard of. You're like, oh my God, the bubonic plague! That's the one you want to pray you get if you get one of these. That's the one you want, okay? Not that you want any plague, but if you want one, you, you gotta go with this. Okay? Here's what happens is you have these swellings called buboes that develop. That's where the name comes from. And they actually, if you look down a, a few of those, um, a few of those, uh, what should we call it, points there, if you look down, <clears throat> excuse me, where the bacteria infect the lymph system and become inflamed, <coughs> excuse me, this is where you get the idea of the buboes. Because when you get into the lymph nodes, you get into the lymph system, the lymphatic system, and it spreads. Okay, that's where if you if you've heard people have cancer, they check the lymph nodes to see if it's spread there. Because the thing is, it might actually go a little bit deeper. It might actually go somewhere else. Now, what they have here is they have these swellings. Okay, they have these swellings of um, places on your body, in your groin, under your arms, in your neck, places where you have the lymph nodes. And that type of thing that drives me crazier than shit right there. Sorry, Fort Knox, sorry. Um, could somebody start? Would you mind that if we did not? Did we already do that? Don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's do that. Oh, you're still here. Could you have this? Yeah. 
good sense to tell me you were a hate because of that worst thing in the world. That drives me crazy. Okay, wait, I should give you something on the test. No, I wouldn't do that. Don't worry. No, no, make it a bonus question. I was going to say I wouldn't. No, actually, you know. I actually make it a no, I feel I feel I feel ethically that that would be bad, so I'm not no. doing that. <laughs> no, no, but but next semester I'm about to get a lot like meaner. I always say that I'm not going to do it. Really? You've had me before. I was to say if you've had me before. You don't get meaner. You know I never get any, <laughs> I never get any meaner because I love my students, but boy do I get mad when people just walk out for like no. What I'm I'm sitting up here sick and dying, and I'm telling you shit for the test. Sorry for it, Mom. And, <laughs> seriously. And we got people like walking out in the middle of it, like, I don't need to be here. Same Trent told me he had a reason. I, I'm with you, buddy. All right, so anyway, <laughs> bubonic plague. Now, here's what's going to happen with the bubonic plague. If you notice, you're going to have what you need to know for the test about the bubonic plague is you need to know that these bubos are going to be, that's where the name comes from. They don't come with all versions of the plague. Now, if you get a bubonic plague, you have a pretty good chance of living. Okay, today, very, very good chance of living. But you're you're thinking you're going to die because it's like a severe form of the flu. You end up with the headache and the joints and the nausea and the vomiting. But here's one thing that's really interesting. They say you have this feeling of despair. Just this, this horrible depression comes over you. Now, today and back then, um, if you if you have the bubonic plague and it goes untreated, if you're going to die, you're going to die within a week. Okay, if you're untreated, you're going to die within a week. That's the general consensus. But if you survived it, you were generally pretty strong. And there were theories. There were theories that were presented in a book several years ago called "In the Wake of the Plague" by Norman Cantor, same guy that wrote last night. Um, one of the theories was that the people who survived the plague, now again, scientifically, he was a little shaky on this, but the theories were that people who survived the plague, the bubonic plague without treatment or any of the others, that they passed on something to their descendants that protected them from things like AIDS and certain forms of cancer and all sorts of things. So the science on that, again, a little bit shaky, but he did make some fairly good points. All right, now, bubonic plague, is going to look like this. Okay, now you see these pictures and you're like, whoa, this is 2006. Okay, I can find newer pictures because the bubonic plague, like I said, still exists. You still have the bubonic plague. Um, the bubonic plague um, is, uh, let's see, I got a coffee stir, but it's not got enough momentum. Um, the bubonic plague. Is, is still around in developing countries, what we used to call third world countries, it's developing countries. And that's why a lot of these pictures, I mean, there, there are people in places that don't have access to the antibiotics, to the medicine, to the care that we do have in the, you know, the, the more developed countries like the United States. And so you see, again, the swellings, they could be the size of an apple or even larger than that, they could be the size of a grape, but those are called the bubos. Now, if bubos are not present, it's not going to be the bubonic plague, but it might be the pneumonic plague. Now, that is sort of what I feel like I've got, sort of, without all of the drama that goes along with it. Um, I actually have, like I said, I have, I have like really bad bronchitis that started from a sinus infection a few weeks ago, and blah, 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 and she said it would have gone into pneumonia if I had waited too long, but... When you hear me say pneumonia, I could have gotten pneumonia. What does that mean? What's what's really bothering you when you have pneumonia? What organs? What's what's being affected? Most of the lungs. Pneumo means lung. Okay, it's lung. So when something gets into, if you're talking about pneumonia or pneumonic or anything to do with pneumo, p n e u m o, pneumo has to do with your lungs. Now, the plague could start in your lungs. Okay, you could start with the pneumonic plague. So if I got, if I happen to have, and I haven't been around any rats or any any rats or rodents or eh, maybe there's a couple of squirrels that have been out on my deck out in the backyard, but I haven't been around any fleas that are going to bite me that would give me the pneumonic plague. But let's say that's what I have instead of bronchitis. So I'm sitting here coughing and hacking into my elbow like you should do during cold and flu season into my elbow. But what if I had the plague, the pneumonic plague? And it's airborne. Infection is airborne. 
Okay? It can spread by me coughing and it coming out in your direction. Okay? Pneumonic plague. That's why they tell people when you have infection, when you have a fever, when you have all this, please stay at home. I don't have a fever. I'm supposedly not contagious, so I'm cool. But what if it was this? Well, then I could infect all of you just by coughing in this room. That, that they say direct to close contact. That means you have a room like this, something like this. Now, the pneumonic plague could be spread person to person. It also, though, could have come as the secondary infection. It could have started out as the bubonic plague. Okay, we could have seen someone who got bit by the rats, fleas, and got the bubonic plague and had the buboes or whatever, and the bubonic plague was left untreated. And maybe it went into their lungs, kind of like my sinus infection. Okay, it was untreated, it went into my lungs. Okay, exactly, and that's what they're trying to protect from. They're trying to protect from all, you know, from all this stuff, but they don't know it's bacteria. She said something about those weird, like, beak-looking, um, the, the different things they would wear, or you had people like, you know, well, Bring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down, coming from the Black Death or the Black Plague, where you had the pocket full of posies, you have a pocket full of flowers, and you would put those in front of your nose where you could smell good things, because they believed in something called miasma. That's actually a good, that's actually a really good extra credit that I don't always talk about. If you want to write down miasma, um, I just happened to think about that, because that's something you need to know. It's not on the, up here. Um, Miasma, M-I-A-S, miasma, M-A, M-I-A-S-M-A, miasma. That's an ancient, like an old belief, definitely really through the medieval times you can see it, the belief that sickness can be caused by foul odors, by smells, by bad smells. And so they don't know the microscopic things, they don't know the germs, they don't know the bacteria, but they have the idea that maybe if you get these bad smells, like from the rotting of the people who get these these versions of the plague, maybe that's what's going to protect you. So they carry posies, you know, or, or flowers around, or they put on those masks or whatever. Now, in this case, so that's called miasma. You just think that bad smells can cause you to contract all sorts of diseases. Now, the septicemic plague, we're going to talk about in a second. It could have started as the septicemic plague. If you know anything about medical terminology, what is sepsis? What's it? What does it have to do with? Because the or bacteria spreads to the rest of your body. Okay, how? Where? Usually it's from an organ being punctured or um, just... How does it go everywhere? Blood. What goes everywhere in your body? Blood. 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 Yes, blood. blood infection. Blood infection. Okay? Septicemic plague is just where the bacteria, we're going to talk about in a minute, but where the bacteria spread through your body, multiplying in the blood. So you could get that first, and it could go to the lungs as well. But if you get the pneumonic plague, even today, pneumonia can kill you, can kill especially elderly people or young children, people with compromised immune system. 90, 95% mortality rate back then, you were pretty much going to die. Now, the, the symptoms, slimy, mutant blood, all this kind of stuff, you get pneumonia very quickly. Shortness of breath, chest pain, cough. But one thing they said, about the pneumonic plague was that you had the, the people who dealt with it noticed that the people who died of this were the people that had it if they survived too but they had a certain smell they couldn't explain how it smelled but they said you would never forget that specific smell it was very specific to the pneumonic plague okay very foul smell about the body now if you don't have your, your not going to die from the pneumonic plague and you've somehow not contracted the pneumonic plague, you're feeling pretty good until you realize that there's a third one. Wait, hang on, let's do this one first. Let me show you this real quickly. It's kind of a flow chart because this is still a thing. Like I said, plague is still a thing. This is modern times where you have people coming from under, you know, the, from the, the developing countries that what if they're on an international flight? What if you suspect somebody's got the pneumonic plague on a flight? What if you suspect they've got that particular disease? Well, the CDC has a whole flow chart there you can look at. And it tells what to do, you know. 
Do you suspect they're you know, a plague patient over on the top right? No, well then don't worry about it. Then you do, do you suspect they're a plague patient? Do this, this, and this. Okay, do you suspect the patient is contagious during an international flight? No, okay, don't worry about it. Yes, whoops, do this, quarantine, blah, 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 blah. So it's very, you know, it, it's very uh, much a thing, very much a thing. But notice they've always got antibiotic therapy in there. They've always got, you know, prophylaxis and so on to keep the community clean and to keep, you know, to keep it from spreading further. I noticed uh, one thing about when I was out in uh, California the other day and stuff, whatever, for uh, Thanksgiving, one thing I noticed was on, like we ride a lot of the trains around because it's just easier and quicker in some ways than driving in the city. And I noticed that there were a lot of people on the trains that I, I'm thinking, I'm like, there's a bunch of germaphobes around here, maybe I should have been one, but wearing the little, just like that, wearing the little mask over their faces on the trains so they don't get sick. So a lot of that. It's not a bad idea at this time of year, really. Right? Right. So, pollution as well. <coughs> yeah. Sometimes to protect yourself. Now, the septicemic plague, this is where the bacteria get in your blood. And we know, like she said, yeah, yeah, it's going through your body, it's going everywhere, it's going to all your organs. It's going to kill you. I mean, sepsis today, if, if you hear that someone is septic, I know from working in nursing homes, I know from working in hospitals, both when I was in college. Um, you know, things have probably gotten better since then a little bit, but it's still, you're still going to know that when someone's septic, there's not a lot of, of, of hope sometimes for turning that around because it's literally gone through your whole body. Now back here, this is the rarest type, okay? Mortality rate, most people are going to die. Again, severe stuff, high fever. Okay, chills, weakness, abdominal pain, shock. Okay, here's the one that really distinguishes it. The one that distinguishes it is the skin turning deep shades of purple because your heart and lung failure and bleeding under the skin or bleeding under the skin and or other organs or so. Okay, now buboes don't develop. So if you end up with the septicemic plague first, which is possible, okay, see, you could have one of the others, and then it develops into pneumonic, then it develops into septicemic or some other order. But this one, you could end up with the worst one first. If you have the bad luck of the draw, and you get bit by a flea that is carrying this bloodborne bacteria, you can get it first, okay? Now the pictures that I put up here, I put up here several years ago, and I need to go back because I don't, some of these I don't trust, they were labeled as septicemic plague. I, some of them I look at and I'm like, I don't know. They kind of look like it. Some of them look like gangrene or frostbite. Yeah. But it's, it's sort of the same idea. You, you still get under the skin, you still get the really nasty, um, you know, the change of skin color and all of this stuff. And once you get to the point where it's like that, your chances even today of survival from something like sepsis is very, very difficult. Now remember, Three types of the plague you need to know for the test. You need to know, you need to recognize the Asernia pestis. And plus all that hundred years war stuff that we talked about and all that stuff last time. Now we're almost done here. We've got five major um, results of the plague that we need to go through. And each one of these is kind of important. To tell you a couple of little things that are not just on the PowerPoint about some of these. Um, the, the first one is a big duh, okay? First one, we've already said, you have this decline in population that is crazy. It's kind of like a class when you start out in the beginning of the semester and you have 30 students in it and then at the end you have like, I don't know, how many, 18 or something. You have this called attrition. Well, what we see here, you see in a lot of your classes, you see very, very high attrition rate in some of the higher math classes. but. <laughs> Math, really, I mean, I, I understand that. I'm right there with them. But massive decline in population because at least, this is at least, 25% of Europeans, we believe, died. Plague goes from 1347 to 1351. The years right here of the heaviest mortality we're counting is 48 to 50. So 48, 49, 50, that's the worst mortality as far as the years go, right? 25% of these villages are abandoned. Now, wait a minute. You're living in a nice, quiet little village, and somebody gets the plague, because, you know, there's rats. 
there's rats over there somewhere. Yeah, they don't have the hygiene. They don't have the um, the exterminators that can come out today and, and get rid of these things or whatever you don't have. So we see people leaving the villages because someone got sick in the village. And I'm, I'm just not staying here because I might catch the plague too. And they go to places like Paris. They go to some of the large cities. That's not good because you know what you have in the cities? You have more people and you have more rats and you have more filth and therefore you have more chances of catching one version or another of the plague. Or okay. spread. What? Or spread it. Or spread it. Yeah, of course. You might, bring, you might be bringing it, you know, depending on how far away you are in the incubation period and so on. Oh, heck yeah. You might be bringing it to the cities and then it, you might also... Actually, people, okay, you guys may or may not want to know this, it's gross, but okay, <laughs> during medieval times and up until early modern times, I mean, people were walking around most of the time with fleas on them. Okay, we had fleas and lice all over us. One of, there's this one guy, Samuel Pepe, who wrote, uh, he, was a, he was an important guy in, uh, in the court of England, and he wrote, I think his diary was from the 1600s. Anyway, Samuel Pepe had one of his maids, one of his maid servants, her entire job was at night, well, her main job, I don't know what she did during the day, but at night, her job was to pick the lice off him when he came home, okay? That's her job. We were just like full of like all this nasty stuff back then. And this is always, this cracks me up when I, when I say this, crack myself up sometimes. But you know, you watch one of these love stories from back in medieval times or some back in the, in the, I don't know, 15, 16, 17, 1800s or something. And all I can think of is, man, those people were nasty. They didn't brush their teeth. They smelled bad and they were crawling with lies. Ooh, I've just ruined every love story from back then, right? Terrible. <laughs> But it's true. I mean, we were we were a pretty filthy lot back then. And let me tell you another thing that I didn't tell you um, that I just that I just remember that I should have told you is one thing I, I mentioned. You know, they were worried about um, the asthma, worried about the smells. Another thing they worried about was taking baths. Okay. Now, here's what I mean by that. <coughs> Truth is. Medieval people liked to take baths. We think they did. We think they're all nasty. But at some point, they actually did like to take baths. Remember, the Romans loved baths. And then at some point, people don't just say, well, we're just not going to take any baths. There's all kinds of factors. One of those factors is the Great Plague, the Black Plague, the Black Death, this, this period right here. Because what they theorized at that time, in addition to all sorts of other things they, they thought was going on, uh, during that time, they believed, some people believed in the asthma, but some people believed that your skin had a certain protective coating on it. That if you took too many baths, if you were too clean, you washed off the protection and you would be susceptible to things like the plague. So they would stop taking baths. Okay? Samuel Puppy, as a matter of fact, I'll go back to quote him or to tell you about him a little bit, again, the 1600s in England, he said, now I want you to let this sink in for a second. I want you to think about it and let it sink in for a second. Samuel Puppy said that he never took a bath in his entire life until his wife made him. <laughs> think about that. She met the man, married him, who had never taken a bath in his entire life. That was not uncommon. That's why. Here's why. If nobody takes a bath or takes very few baths, basically, if everybody stinks, nobody does. You all get used to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just think about it now. You got to think about it. If, if you stink and everybody else stinks, what you going to do? You're going to distinguish? We all get used to, we get acclimated to our smells. And that, whether it's our human smells or whether, okay, the big one that I always, I think it makes it click with people, is uh, if you go to Hershey, Pennsylvania, the people in Hershey don't smell chocolate. We do. We go to Hershey, Pennsylvania, we're like, oh my God, it's heaven. <laughs> They're used to it. Okay? When I was a little kid, I lived on like close to my grandpa's farm, and uh, there were cows out there, and I remember going back there as an adult and saying, holy, you know, do they always smell like this? 
And my mother's like, like what? <laughs> yeah, it did. We get acclimated to it. So, again, people didn't take a lot of baths partially because of this. Now, what they would do, though, and this is stuff I'm telling you that, you know, I did should have told you earlier, but I just didn't think about it. But what they would do is they would still sometimes take baths, but instead of taking quite a few baths, they would get cinnamon or they would get rose petals or flowers and rub them all over their body. Okay? Even into the Victorian era, you had a lot of Victorian women, they wouldn't take baths, and so they would just spray themselves or douse themselves with lots of perfume. Ooh, kind of gross, right? You know, do they smell good? Eh, by those standards, I guess they smell better than maybe the alternative. But that's the way that people thought was the miasma and the you know layer of your skin and so on. So that's kind of fall out of favor here, or, you know, really out of favor. Now, 25% of villages, though, abandoned. The survivors going out to the larger towns and so on and so forth. But what about the church? Now, the church is already weakened, you know, the having non papacy. We talked about the having non papacy. You guys had that audio, right? What audio? Or did you? We, did we have to do an audio for you guys, or were we able to actually do? I think we were able to do pretty good with you guys. I think it was only. Yeah, because yeah, it was maybe. Monday. Never mind, it was Monday that had that audio because I did this Monday. Okay. So we're okay. We're actually where we should be. All right. Anyway, we only had like one long audio. Now, the church power, the Avignon papacy, yeah, remember the papacy? I told you the guy looked like Uncle Fester, Martin V. Um, but anyway, the church power has been weakened. The Avignon papacy had become very materialistic. They were under control of the French kings. They're away from Rome, and they're not really doing the work of the church. Now, people start to mistrust the church for a lot of other reasons. One of these things is the church cannot cure the plague. Now, the church can't cure the plague, okay. Prayer can't cure the plague. Nothing the church does cures the plague. You have this group of monks called the flagellants. I'm going to spell it for you. F-L-A-G, like flag, flagellants. F-L-A-G, E, L-L-A-N-T-S. Just spell it if anybody needs to know it right now. Flagellants. F-L-A-G-E-L-L-A-N-T-S. Okay. These, these monks, what they believe, a group of monks that believed that the plague was God's punishment on humans for our sins. And so what they did was they went from town to town, village to village, city to city, beating themselves with whips on their back, beating themselves bloody to do penance to take the plague away. Okay, And they'd go from place to place. Now, what we see here is that it doesn't work. I mean, of course it doesn't work. Okay, they, they were doing what they believed was right, doesn't help. Now, another thing, though, that I didn't mention earlier because I was waiting to get to this point, is let's say that you're a mom, okay, and your baby, for some reason, starts exhibiting uh, maybe move up or something very visible, and maybe you think they have a plague. To us today, it would be unthinkable for most of us to take our baby and abandon it, right? For most of us, you're not going to go take your baby and throw it out and say, ooh, you know, the baby has the plague. But what happened back then? You had husbands leaving wives. You had wives leaving husbands. You had families leaving babies and old grannies and everybody else. Sometimes they would just burn down the house when they leave. Just leave the person who was dying and then just burn it down. But sometimes if they were nice, they would take the, the family member or whoever to a monastery. There's really no hospitals like we have today. So the monks, they had taken a vow that they would help people. So what we see is the monks are going to be hit hard. She have a lot of babies, a lot of family members left at the monasteries and the convents, for that matter, the nuns. So a lot of monks and a lot of nuns are going to catch the plague and they're going to die. We end up with a shortage of clergy. Now much of the progress of the, you know, the uh, Concordant of Worms, remember from, from 11, 22, where we had between the emperor and the, um, the the papacy, where we had this power struggle kind of solved, we're going to start to see the emperors and the kings taking more power again, which also weakens the church even further. And here's where you were, you were saying about the Jews. Yeah. Okay, there's widespread persecution of minorities, particularly Jews, very small minority. And here's the thing: think about it this way. 
Okay. Everybody uses the same water. Everybody uses the same um, wells. Okay. Keep that in mind. There are rumors that the Jews were surviving or they were not getting the plague because they were poisoning the wells. Now that's absolutely ridiculous because they couldn't poison the wells and use the same water that everyone else was using and survive. It's not possible. So these are rumors the Jews were not poisoning the wells. What the Jews were actually doing was they were following the law of Moses from the Old Testament. They were following the laws regarding cleanliness and hygiene. One of those things is they had to use running water to wash their food, that sort of thing. They washed their hands. There's a lot of hygienic things that a lot of the other people at that time were not doing for many reasons, a couple of which we've already talked about. Okay, So they're less likely to get the plague because of their hygienic practices. From the Old Testament, the law of Moses tells them, you know, ways to eat and ways to clean themselves. Now, I like this one. I like this, this mood of morbidity. Basically, it sounds terrible, right? This mood of morbidity. But it's, it's an idea of living for the moment. You've heard the story, uh, or the saying, rather, of eat, drink, and be merry. Right? Eat, drink, and be merry. Do you know the third line of that? Okay, you know the third line of that. Anybody? Third line is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. Okay? So they're basically saying live for now, do whatever you want to do. You want to go have a blizzard at Dairy Queen? Have five of them. You want to go get drunk? Just get drunk. Do whatever you want to do because we're going to die anyway. So we're going to try with or something like that? I guess, but in, in the mood of morbidity, what you're saying is basically we are going to die because everyone around us is dying. Twenty-five percent of the people at least are dying, and I'm probably one of them. So let's just do whatever we want. Now, we have a later plague that comes about out of 1600s or 1500s, uh, where you have a guy named Giovanni Boccaccio. Okay, Boccaccio writes a book called The Decameron. Now, this Decameron is very much set up as a frame tale, just like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. The Decameron tells a story, the frame tale, is a bunch of young men and women who want to escape the plague, and so they go into one of the father's, one of their father's castles, and they lock themselves away, which is actually a smart thing to do, if you think about it. They lock themselves away, and then, to pass the time, they tell stories to each other, and that's, you know, again, kind of like, like the Canterbury Tales. But this one, the Decameron, is, um, you know, again, from a later version of the play, but it's the same kind of idea. If you read Boccaccio's introduction to the Decameron, he talks about some things that I just scientifically can't believe. Like he talks about people um, like pigs or whatever, pigs or cows or whatever it was, that had gotten maybe rooting in or rolling in, I guess it would be pigs if they're rooting and rolling, rolling in some blankets or some, some things that had been covering the people who had died from the plague, and then those pigs immediately just rolled over and died. And I was like, that doesn't sound scientifically right. But he was trying to give, I guess, his interpretation of what was happening. But anyway, Boccaccio's Decameron is something that you'll probably, if you take literature classes, if you're especially if you're if you're really interested in uh, literature, you're going to read some of the Decameron, and it's a you know it's a, a very um, it's a very excellent look into a version of the play. So again, live for the moment. And in the Decameron, you've got these people talking about all these fantasies and the ideas are, you know, just go and have sex with whoever you want to. And like I said, get drunk, um, just do all sorts of debauchery. Anyway, now another example of the mood of morbidity is the dance macabre. Um, anyway, okay. The Danse Macabre right here. One of those, like, I wonder why it's not showing that, but okay. Uh, the Danse Macabre 
is not a dance, even though that's what it literally uh, that's what it literally stands for. The Das Macabre is an allegory. Okay, it's an allegory meaning the dance of death. Okay. So back to it's a well, it's an allegory, it's symbolic. So instead of actually there being a dance that you go out and do, you know, you're going to do this dance of death before you die, which is ridiculous. Okay, what this is is an allegory, which represents, okay, in many different ways, the dance macabre is going to be uh, represented by pictures, you know, by paintings, by drawings, by etchings, and so on of death, portrayed as maybe a skeleton or a grim reaper or whatever dancing with someone. You can read that stuff at the bottom if you want to. It's pretending to be old English, but it's it's really not. Uh, it's just kind of written in that form that it looks like it, but it's an actual poem from one of the, the times of the play. Uh, the Philosophy Club actually showed a movie a while back called The Seventh Seal. And you know, if anybody noticed that, or if you've ever heard of that, The Seventh Seal is a great movie that it, it, it illustrates the allegory here also of death coming to everyone in the play. You have this family, uh, I haven't seen it for years, in fact, I think the movie came out maybe in the 50s or early 60s, but you have this family back in, in you know early play times that many of them are dying and they're trying to escape the play. And so one of the members of the family, this one guy, he meets death. He actually meets death. And he challenges death to a, a match of chess, to a game of chess. And the thing is, if he wins, his family is going to survive. If he loses, his family is going to die. Okay? So it's called the Seventh Seal. I don't know if anybody has time to watch that before, you know. But it is, it is interesting if you ever get a chance to watch it. Now, it becomes a popular allegory as we see death portrayed constantly. Again, many different ways. There's death dancing with this person or, or beckoning them to dance. Dancing with this guy. My favorite one's this one, though. This is actually from a later, from the 15th century, from a later version of the play. Remember, none of them are going to be as bad as the one that came in the 1340s and early 50s. None of them are ever going to be that devastating. But there's going to be more. Now, this one right here, the play is going to strike at all levels, right? So you're going to have the Grim Reaper in this case, you know, death. He's going to take his turn dancing with everybody. A priest, a peasant, a woman, and a child. Okay? So in other words, nobody is going to escape the dance of death. One day, death will also be patting you on the shoulder or tapping you on the shoulder and asking you to come dance with them. Okay? And that was something that was constantly on their minds. Now, again, you have to understand, too, you can't judge the morality and the, the thinking and the actions of people in past times by our own standards. That's very difficult, it's very difficult sometimes to understand. But just because the past resembles the present does not mean that it is like the present. Because when we say, like today, very seriously, I say, I don't know anyone who would just throw out their baby, burn them in a house. Back then, you were not encouraged, because infant mortality rate was so high, you were not encouraged to bond with an infant. You were not encouraged to really, to, to be attached to that baby until they were, you know, at least over a year old. You never cried, you never grieved for a baby who died under a year old. Okay, you never did that. That just wasn't done. And so a lot of times, the nobles had the nannies, the wet nurses, someone else is taking care of those babies because the mortality rate was so incredibly high. So again, we can't judge their, you know, their way of thinking was the babies are probably not going to live anyway. And their way of thinking about the older folks is, you know, they've lived a good long life. Man, you know, he's 44 years old. It's time for him to go. That kind of thing. Really, I mean, that's their thinking. So again, that's my favorite one. That's from a fresco, church fresco. The fifth one is also sort of a dumb one, because if you were able to live through the plague, well, 25 to 30% of the people gone, you're going to prosper. You're going to have a better chance of getting more land. Let's say you're a peasant, you're a farmer. 
Okay, there's going to be more food for you. There's going to be more land for you. You're going to be able to afford it because, hey, the demand is not there. There's not so many people that are wanting that land. And you see the peasants end up making a lot more money then because money's come back in vogue, remember. Now, here's the problem. This is where we have what are called sumptuary laws. Sumptuary laws regulate what people wear. You've all heard of things like the color purple. You don't wear purple unless you're royal or whatever in certain times, in certain cultures, in certain situations, um, because it's so expensive to make that and to dye it and whatever. But you have sumptuary laws being used a lot. For example, in Hitler's Germany, you're going to have the Jews who have to wear a yellow Star of David. And a lot of them said Yuda or said Jew on it. When you were outside in public, you had to wear that prominently on your clothing so they could tell that you were less than, that you were not a citizen after 1935. You were just a persona non grata. You were just, you were meaningless, okay? Sumptuary laws had been used on slaves throughout history because slavery, remember, wasn't based on ethnicity a lot of time. It was based on, hey, we captured these guys. And so we're going to put them in slave clothes. We can tell the slaves for months. And sometimes that wasn't a good thing. Like the Spartans, if you recall, had way too many slaves. They would have risen up if they were able to wear the right, you know, slave clothes. So some party laws regulate what people wear. In this case, the peasantry. The peasants are starting to get better food. They're starting to get um, really taking on airs of being rich by trying to dress like a member of the upper class. And what the, high, what the higher class or what the nobles do not want is they do not want to look out there and to see groups of people and not be able to recognize their own. They don't want to look at somebody and say, wow, you know, um, everybody around here is a noble. I haven't thought somebody would have been a peasant. They, they want to set themselves apart. Okay, So they don't want the peasants to dress and act as a higher class than what they are. It's to keep them in a subordinate position. Those are called sumptuary laws. Now, the last little thing here, yeah, that's literally the last thing. Ah, we didn't get out very early. Um, the plague is going to return many times. One thing to take note of, though, is that there's parts of Europe, in general, you know, Europe is not going to recover the population from 25% of the, of the death toll, the people in Europe dying. They're not going to recover in some parts until the 1600s. Okay. Now imagine, though, imagine if you will, that those 25 to 30% of Europeans did not die in the 1340s and early 50s. Imagine how many children and grandchildren and, and then descendants they would have had. Okay. You can see that. That would have been, that would have been um, in many ways, probably a very different Europe had they continued, had they been allowed to live. As one of those times where you have either a natural disaster like the plague or some kind of genocide like the Holocaust that takes out maybe an entire generation or so. Maybe World War I did that also. World War I took out an entire generation of young men in Europe. An entire generation of young men. So we're going to see different times where um, you kind of see either through natural, yeah, natural disasters or occurrences or through our own stupidity, aka war and that type of thing. Sometimes we see the, um, the human herd kind of being culled down a little bit. And, and again, it's kind of interesting to think, you know, if all those people had lived and been able to prosper, what would have, what would have changed? So we don't know. And that's really, that's the end the end that's the very last one so I've actually had a pretty good time in here the only problem I've had is because Fort Knox had so many issues that were not their fault um, it's not the students fault but you know as far as that goes I actually I like to know you guys are in person yeah because I get to see you and whatever and I like to tell stories um, I just wish I could have been able to have communicated better with Fort Knox that's the only regret about this class so I'm going to go ahead and stop recording this Fort Knox. I'm going to have to figure out a way to get you guys at Fort Knox the final exam. I will have to communicate with 
someone over there in the office and somehow or other. You have the option of coming on campus and taking it with us. 